Um, thank you all very much for coming. My name is Helen Allen. I'm uh, the director of The Winter Show. Uh, as you all may know, The Winter Show is uh, going into its 66th year. Uh, we are owned uh, by and benefit Eastside House Settlement. Uh, and Eastside House Settlement is a spectacular organization in the Bronx, community service-based organization in the Bronx that raises much needed funds for those in need, aging from ages, age two to 102. Uh, and our primary base is educational programming. So it only made sense for us with the Winter Show to uh, partner with colleagues and friends such as the Kolnagi Foundation to work with our partners to develop educational programming uh, and and such to kind of further Eastside House's mission, but on our end as well. So I want to thank Loie DeVore for having us today. Thank you so much for hosting us and for having us. Um, Loie is going to introduce all of our, um, all of our speakers, but uh, the Kolnagi Foundation uh, is, a, is, a, is a dear friend of the Winter Show. So thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. You have to stay there. Find your way. Yes. Walk towards the light. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we have uh, like six degrees of separation between all of us here. Um, it couldn't be more special to me to do something with a winter show that. I, my children grew up in, and I was actually, I was a dealer at the winter show for a long time, <laughs> and on the dealer committee, and, and in my new role, I have this wonderful opportunity to be able to work with you and continue to sort of help, um, you know, figure out our voice, your voice, and also serve our mission, which is trying to bring new people to the world of wonderful old things and trying to remind people why we do what we do and why we love what we love. So this event is, is something very, it, it has a great um, connection to Kolnagi as well as to me personally. But Kolnagi, even though we're based in London, we're based in Europe, we're the oldest gallery in the world, uh, we have been serving the collecting world of America in a very, very profound and important way um, since the Gilded Age because we were sort of the primary dealers, the feeder of great old master paintings to Frick, to Morgan, to Isabel Stewart Gardner, to Paul Mellon, to all of the great American collectors that then left their collections as legacies to their cities. Um, in the form of museums. So um, this is a really interesting topic for me, but it was wonderful to meet Jennifer Tonkovich, who I'm gonna introduce, who is going to sort of be speaking on behalf of Morgan. And he was a sort of great rogue collector. I've been fascinated by my whole, <laughs> you know, I've always been obsessed about why people collect. So this is really interesting to me. Um, and Morgan technically didn't listen to anyone. So I love that Jennifer has been at the Morgan for many years. years. 21 <laughs> years. Um, and, and knows intimately the wonderful stories of Morgan. And Emerson and I sat next to, we have like our wonderful stories, our own personal stories, because he and I met last year about this time at, at Tape Off, and we sat next to each other at a dinner at Kolnagi. Um, in the Netherlands before I was even part of Kolnagi officially <laughs> and we became fast friends very fast friends and he his career was launched at the Frick and it started there and then he co-curated in San Francisco but at the Met and he co-curated as I say like one of the great landmark revolutionary shows of all time the like life show if any of you saw that um, fantastic show. He is now at the Chicago Institute. And Courtney Booth, who I have known also from my many years in this world at the Winter Show and at Sotheby's, you were in client services. You Actually, I think you said you held every job at Sotheby's except you never got to be the doorman. Doorman. <laughs> never got I was to be the waiting doorman. for that. But now she's a private advisor, but she's also in And a, still a, wants to be a doorman. I still do. wants to be a doorman. Just do every day. Every day. Yes. You know, only Clients in our own homes. Clients' needs are so much more 
focused at the door. <laughs> yeah. But Courtney was also on the young, you were always head of like the young collector's yes. night, the like, oh, night yeah. at the winter show. And she's now um, at one of the biggest private advisory firms ever. But she's also the daughter of big American collectors. So she's grown up in the collecting world. She was raised in this collecting world in America. And then we have Mitch Owens, who I'm so pleased to finally meet because I've been reading your articles for years in <laughs> Architectural Digest, and you've been one of our ardent supporters, and we meaning the world of early art. So thank you so much as our <laughs> moderator. And with that, enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> I think this is, a, this is a very relevant and exciting topic, I think, for all of us tonight, but also for all of you, but also in terms of collecting history, since this event is happening three days following the death of one of the great American collectors of all time, um, Mrs. Reitzman, who died on Saturday at the age of 99, yes. um, and spending a good 60 plus years buying, funding, Supporting. Throwing money, supporting, yeah. thank you. Throwing, <laughs> supporting is a better idea than throwing money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the idea that, that collecting is, is sort of in the air, but I think what's, what's hugely important, although we're starting at the Gilded Age, um, and going forward to what American collecting was, what it is, maybe it's the same thing still. But I think what's really important is what is our definition of a collector? I buy things I like, but does that make me a collector? I would suggest Emerson says no. <laughs> well, I said no, but, but I actually think, you know, it is important to remember that there are many kinds of collecting, and the collecting impulse has always been there, um, and whether it's postage stamps or paintings by LeBron, um, it, 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 it speaks to a more uh, fundamental um, aspect of our personalities, I think, which yeah. is to, to, to gather together things. Um, and it's simply done on different levels, <laughs> I think, um, and has been throughout history. Jennifer? Yeah, I'm not snobby about it. I think when you look at it from a sociological <coughs> perspective and somebody like a fellow Chicagoan, Mahali, Csikszent Mahali, you know, the meaning of things for me was a fundamental text where he went into the homes of, of hundred you know, families in Chicago and asked them about the things they collected and they attached meaning to. Um, and it was interesting to see what all the family members in the place that they lived assigned meaning to um, and saw as things that they collected. And I think, um, so I feel very open about the definition of collecting. And, but I do think it is a fundamental human impulse to gather things and assign value to them and find your identity through them. So I think there's, it's such a wide range of, of collecting, but I think yours counts. I think you are a collector. <laughs> <laughs> You're um, Well, when I'm yelling at my father, who won't sell anything, I call them hoarders with meat. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I actually studied collectors, and I wrote my thesis in college on Abby Alder Rockefeller, who I consider to be one of the most um, sort of landscape-changing collectors out there. And I love the, the, the long-running thread through all of this of, of women who, at a time when they didn't have many means, actually changed the cultural language of our country, um, which continues today. Uh, but I studied uh, the text of uh, Dr. Werner Munsterberger, who, if you, if you do have time or have trouble sleeping, wrote a very, very deep text about collecting that has a lot of psychological and, and physiological uh, oh, yes. anecdotes about what collecting really means. Um, I like to think of collectors, and I do think what's, what we're going to come, what we're going to try and talk about today, is what we all see as as maybe a thread that's always been there, but is more prevalent than ever. Um, and I'll start with with the less inspired option first: um, is people who are trophy hunting, mm -hmm. um, and that there's a certain degree of box checking and um, masterpiece seeking, and there are artists out there who have literally made careers not by being provocative, but by being identifiable. And so that when you walk into somebody's home, they want you to be able to say, that's a Richard Prince, and that's a Warhol, and that's a Hearst, because they have style and, and branding, for lack of a better word. Um, collectors, for me, if I'm thinking about it emotionally, not yelling at my father, 
um, are, are, are people with, um, who have married intellect with object, that they have um, sought to become and continue to be students throughout their mm -hmm. lives while they pursue other lives, you know, other lives, professional lives, family lives, etc. They open up railroad tracks that are on a different, on a different level. Um, and and it go, going in a different direction. And the thing I love best about collectors, and actually I was reading Jane's biography, Mrs. Reitzman's biography this morning, collectors I think are people who understand that they own an object for a very brief moment in its trajectory, and then they send it somewhere else. Um, and so for me, collectors are, are people who understand that, that continuum. Mm -hmm. cool. It's very interesting that you said that, because I know that a friend of mine who's in antiques dealer in New York, that's one of the things he's always sort of talking with clients about, is that you will own this for a finite period of time. Right. You will be part of its trajectory. Yeah. That's what should be important to you, yeah. is that you have come next yeah. in that train, yeah. and that there will be somebody else after you. Yeah. But I think what's really interesting, too, is, is all of these collectors, and, and we all have our specialties and our all favorites. I mean, Elizabeth, Isabella Stewart Gardner is like one of my favorites. Um, is they all have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And although our, our discussion is the Gilded Age until now, can any of you discuss about the idea of an American point of view in collecting prior to that incredible moment of industrial money and being able to sort of hoover up masterpieces from <laughs> Europe? I guess I, I would think of like James Jackson Jarvis who was writing earlier in the century and, and you know, his whole idea of, of setting up this premise that American collectors could be like the great patrons of the Florentine Renaissance. Mm -hmm. it very politically and ideologically driven, of course, because it was a republic. Mm -hmm. It was the most democratically produced art. This idea that that would be an American collector's, a new American millionaire's parallel would be found in the, the Florentine Renaissance. And that certainly the collecting of that material, he very much promoted and made that equation. And I think that helps frame our understanding of the collecting of Renaissance art in America. But certainly, I think there were a handful of people writing in the mid-19th century mm -hmm. about what Americans could collect, what Americans should collect. But it always has been coupled with also the sense of the private and the public. Um, and I think certainly going into the Gilded Age, and Morgan was somebody about whom the, the press constantly wrote about um, their own, the, the public's interest in Morgan's collecting, in the sense that you, know, you could collect privately as an individual, but once it reached a certain scale, you certainly must have public ambitions. And because Morgan also functioned financially as you know, the country's savior on several occasions, in the fiscal crisis of 1895 or 1907, there's this sense that his collecting too must benefit mm -hmm. the country in a way, that there must be some, some patriotic impulse to that. And I think that the seeds are sown by Jarvis and, and, and others writing in the mid-19th century for that template, that way of thinking about collecting as, as a, you know, as a cultural, in the cultural context. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's also, you know, in the later 19th century, just an absolute fascination on the part of the public with, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's glitzy and glamorous, and everyone wants to know who's buying what and where. I mean, I, I've read so many articles from the period, newspaper articles about this painting by Jerome just docked in New York. It's going to so and so, who's paid more than anyone's ever paid for this painting before. And there are entire articles, you know, devoted to this. So this is remarkable, growing interest. Like when the Kardashians the go to the supermarket. Exactly. I mean, it seems. <laughs> It's exactly the equivalent of yeah. that, I, and, and, and it's fascinating to me that it becomes yeah. part of a public discourse yeah. um, what others are collecting. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you have this same contemporary going back across yeah. time. I mean, it's, it's, it's of a great interest to the public. Yeah. Who you bought know, the Leonardo I mean, Leonardo sort of you know, right. you know it's, we want to know. Yeah. But it's storytelling, too. I mean, it's, it's, it's shaping an American identity. I mean, when I think sort of pre- Gilded Age, I go back to my Philadelphia roots, um, and think of Charles Wilson Peale, you know, creating a museum which mm. was ornithology and a cabinet of curiosities and was, you know, dinosaur bones excavated, I think God 
forgive us in New Jersey. And, you know, it, he had so many things and, and they really were, it was borrowing an imprint from Europe, mm -hmm. but it was also desperately trying to frame an American identity. And there's a, there's an, you know, there, there is that sort of interesting trajectory where you start with, you know, Charles Wilson Peel and this, and this, and this sort of very natural, very of the earth collection, because mm. there was something else yeah. to exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then that's exactly what Thomas Cole and Frederick Church and, right. you know, all of those Americans who are framing again that, that American story. And then it morphs again. I mean, and then it, you know, it goes from that very American moment, purely a purely American material, mm. American collectors, American, and then you know you get to Duveen. What did Duveen say? Yes, uh, like Europe, Civil War. America has the money, and Europe has the art, or something. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I just butchered yeah. that. Can we? We're gonna. <laughs> 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 we're gonna in editing. We're gonna. We're gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get those. That, that word. It's just so much about capital. Yeah, it's, it's it about is. the building yeah. of capital, and and that was a big thing personally for Morgan, but also for his generation. Is that. That and the transfer well, globally yeah. of centers of global wealth. Yeah. Global wealth and also global inspiration. So you have all of these incredibly newly, fantastically rich Americans. Mm -hmm. And who are they looking toward? They're looking mm -hmm. toward the Rothschilds. Yeah. They're looking toward, I mean, who, is, who are their contemporaries financially? Right. And what are they collecting? Yeah. And they seem to be adopting a sort of omnivorousness. Um, when you think about Morgan, mm -hmm. whose who's, who's interests are not narrow, they're colossally broad. Yes. <laughs> and I, I find him hugely inspiring, yeah. because he really does have this omnivorous eye, which in some ways, to me, feels very American in a way of, it's, it's this constant desire for knowledge and footnotes and reaching back in time mm -hmm. and commissioning. And I mean, it, it's a... I mean, I think he's an extraordinarily great early Gilded Age American collector. Yeah. Well, and also that, you know, while he's building up these collections, you know, some of them are in London, some things are coming to New York, he gets directly involved in changing the tariff structure yes. um, in order to be able to bring those things to really, like, you know, these tariff laws were changed for him to, because there was so much interest you know, in this country, and him being able to bring his collections mm -hmm. here. Um, Which, that, that ironically enough, you know, is also mirrored in the Rightsman. The reason yes. the Rightsman yes. 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 is so funny. Yes. When they, when they, <laughs> they change the tariffs own. around, yep. around and, and oil. And so it's always one of those things we can romanticize collectors, and certainly Morgan <laughs> on such a vast scale, there's so much to be said about him. But then you stop and realize the financial realities of this, and, and the, of the tariffs, and of the death duties that were then about to be imposed mm -hmm. in, in London. Um, so it made such sense, but it's also something that in the American press, it was very clear the American people had a stake in this. The American people had an interest in this. And I think being that level of a national character um, and also on that scale, the sense is what, in, it's also a little bit morality. Like, you know, it would be excessive collecting if that were just mm. for one person. It <laughs> must have a public good. It might, and right. Which he did, it indeed did want it to. But Do you think I, I, that I, is a yeah. part of the American collecting mm. philosophy and experience I, is the public Well, so when it works in a museum, it's very funny. You do meet new collectors, and there is a sense of, you know, if you are building up a collection of some significance, um, you know, we'd like to assume people are thinking about the eventual destiny of it, the eventual legacy of it. Um, and it's an interesting mix. In my career, I've worked with people like Jean Thaw, who very early mm. on committed yeah. to an institution, yeah. has a great collection, continued to build it. And working with an institution was something that he felt very strongly about. There's other collectors who are very much in our orbit now, um, who may be well into their 90s and have made no plans for the dispersal of their collection. Mm -hmm. And so wow. confronting what happens to things. I also had a conversation um, earlier this year during sales week uh, with a couple of people, and there was a, a dealer and collector who was very much committed to his things going back to the market. Yeah. You know, at the end and saying, yeah. you know, I, I want these back in the market for, for others to, to collect. For others right. to and yeah. another collector on the panel, a great old master drawings collector, said, I believe these should go to an institution, you know, what we've built up. So but I do think curators today, there is an expectation that collections of certain significance um, should be it, it should be a conversation that happens, but that the majority of collectors, um, I think, do affiliate with 
mm. with institutions and, and you know, as a way to exhibit their collection, as a way to open it. Um, that's more in the old masters, I think. In contemporary, there's much more an option right. of actually opening your own museum. <laughs> right. it, well, yes. <laughs> I, I, I think the number of private museums opening in China is roughly up to the number of KFCs that go to yeah, no, it's, on it's a daily basis. It's, 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 um, it's, amazing. it's amazing. And you have Glen, you know, Glenstone just opened. Um, there are obviously there are a lot of 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 private, largely modern and contemporary focused museums that are opening. And what's interesting is there is, again, to bring the financial, because you can't really extricate it, um, th there was a change in the tax law. I mean, the government literally said you can't keep having these private museums that aren't open. And so whether it was born out of a, a, out of a philanthropic uh, urge from the beginning or, or, or you know, compelled by tax dollars, um, you do have have a remarkable number of, of private museums that are that are being put together. All I mean, literally all over the world. That is my you know as I advise clients who are selling literally on an international. I have a, I have a Gauguin flying to Taipei as we speak, um, which will be seen by two curators of two private museums in Singapore um, and Taiwan while it's over there. And and that's that's where. That is a very real part, and I don't want to mm -hmm. fast forward no, too, no, no, too far about. into into the future. But um, but it does. It, it sort of dovetails because one of the things I'm very interested in is we're, we're we're talking about at least in the start the you know for a certain period of time for let's say the first five decades of Gilded Age to sort of mid 20th century, a lot of these collectors who we think of as pioneering American collectors, they're also incestuously entwined with dealers yes. who are pioneering in their own right, yes. who are feeding you know, European uh, works of art to American collectors. And as we were talking about earlier during my first glass of wine, um, we, were, we, were, we, were, we were talking That's about... That's when we talked about all the good exactly. stuff. Exactly. <laughs> we were talking about this sort of idea of, 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 of dealers constantly having to refresh their collections. Yeah. They are professional collectors, but they're spinning things off because to do that, they can only buy... They, they have to do that to buy more things. Yeah. Can we talk a bit about... Duveen, Berenson, the people who were steering these early collectors in a certain world, in a certain genre. Well, I think you're right. It's so linked together because at the same time, you have the birth of these institutions, and so you've got curators coming into the mix. You have the collectors like Morgan. You have also the European intellectuals like Willem van Boda. Um, and then these dealers who are also, I would say it's dealers slash intellectual, not to imply that they couldn't be, but that you have somebody who's working for Durlacher Brothers, like Murray Marx, who's right. writing with both of these great bronze catalogs. They're defining the era of, of various artists, but they're also working together to sell these works as they come up. And so now I feel like if you look at the the field of, say, small bronzes from the Renaissance, it's so complicated to disentangle the history of some of these attributions because um, it's a moment where you have modern scholarship and book publications you know, coalescing at the same time as this material's coming out of these European collections and being sold to Americans. Exactly, and all these dealers are looking Yes, and you have people America. with great names <clears throat> who turn out to be um, a bit nefarious players. So there's also the, you know, <laughs> Kelly Lazzaroni's and the Stefano Bardini's. But and not the Kodagas. Not, not the Kodagas. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is interesting because, you know, there are also people who are both handling things good and, and things yeah. that are probably of more recent vintage yeah. capitalizing on some of these trends in the market. And so it's, it's a complex but fascinating period. Well, and, and dealers are no longer shop owners. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the real difference, I think, that, that happens around the turn of the 20th century. Yeah. It's the sort of birth of the dealer as a personality, yeah. as somebody who sells a lifestyle as well mm -hmm. as physical objects to go in right. houses. Yeah. Um, and Duveen, I think, was yeah. one of the I great I think Charlotte ones. Vignon's book on Duveen is yeah. coming out momentarily. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's going to be... Oh, terrific. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait. Long away. <laughs> yes, long away. I think it's, it's going to be revelatory. So. But that is something again, and again, I think I, I think I'm the I'm, I'm the voice of sort of the more contemporary uh, 
part of the panel maybe a little bit, but if we are again going to talk about where it started and, and where it's gone to, you know, as we look at the art world now as a, as a $64 billion a year industry, those were the numbers in for 2018, um, I do think that's one thread that's maybe changed a little bit, that there is a lot more if we're gonna say something, one nice thing about the art world, um, that, that there is a little bit more accountability and a little less conflict of interest maybe, that you don't have the Duveens of the world who were dictating taste, style, source, and authenticity all in the same go, right? right. Can we, can no, we, I, we, can I, agree with that. I mean, there's still some massive issues with authentication as, as, a, as an act, but it does now mm -hmm. live in its own world to a certain extent, and it's not people who have who are wearing that an authentication hat on a Tuesday and a and a dealer's hat on a Wednesday, which would have been parents. <laughs> would have been parents. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. But the idea that there's these pure pristine roles where you're only yeah. one thing turns yeah. out to be not right. true for any of it. No. no. At, at any no. period. No. <laughs> but you know, I think when you you when you come to it, you try and pigeonhole well, this person's this this you know, and I think we all know from our experience and all the dealers that we work. With, I mean, there's there's no way to say. I mean, there's so much scholarship being done. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think across the board by people who are finding this material, writing about this material, and selling this material. Well, this is what makes the early 20th century of American collecting really very very interesting, because there are these paintings that are thought of as this, but were school of that, or vice mm -hmm. versa. Right. But yet, there was a great deal of of research and digging and. Mm -hmm. I guess trying to prove what it was. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And and you know perhaps an overly generous understanding of what an artist's oeuvre was at that point in time as well, which probably <laughs> had something to. I mean, I will say Frick's first Rembrandt is turned out not to be a Rembrandt, um, and he paid a gargantuan amount of money for it. Um, you know, it involved multiple trips to London and back. It was a whole. But in the end, now it's thought to be school of, follower of, no mm. longer in the collection. Um, so and it was kind of the wild west back then, you know, back then. Yeah. I think, but yeah, that's well, what's it's it's exciting so about it. Seligman was going to open yeah. a, a fake museum in New York, yeah. like all yeah. the yeah. Uh, fakes that he collected <laughs> during the course of the time of being a dealer to, to share. And it also, when he was going to open that fake museum in the early part of like, 1910 or so, the whole idea was that it was going to be to educate people yeah. about the art market. Right, yeah. exactly. You know, and so there is, especially in America, I feel this constant thought of collections as an opportunity to bring this to the public, to the American people, and even something like that, like the idea of doing an exhibition, sharing these fakes yeah. mm -hmm. with the American people, yeah. always learning, always the, this, this emphasis on learning from it, you know. That's really, that's, that's really interesting. Could you talk about that as well? I mean, because you know, so much of what was being funneled into America through Duveen, et cetera, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, you know, it was coming from established collections. It was coming from people who said, my palazzo is so packed, and I've got to repair the roof. I so have off taxes. goes that yeah. 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 you know, yeah. So I'm wondering, too, is, 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 is education, is that sort of, is, is a, a, a new uh, era of scholarship part of what distinguishes American taste versus European taste. I mean, I'm trying to sort of figure mm. out: can we fragment what's American? What's the what's the difference between the American impulse mm -hmm. at that point of time, maybe different now yeah. than the European impulse? It's definitely very civic-minded. I think you know, yeah. Um, yeah. on the part of the American collectors, but also on the part of the American press that is mm. understood to be that way. Um, yeah, because even a couple of the collections that Morgan brought over, um, his collection of Renaissance bronzes, his collection of uh, especially medieval art, these were things that couldn't be seen elsewhere in America. The collections right. just weren't there, and the press over them was so enthusiastic and, and excited, and it was almost a new discovery. Mm -hmm. And so the sense of you know, American citizens having the, these opportunities to have this material come to them, to learn from them, um, without having to go and travel. I mean, there's an insularity to it. There's a certain patriotism slash jingoism possibly, <laughs> you know, that comes into play. Um, but it was, it is amazing how much it's seen as, as a public concern and as, as something that's really 
meant for people. And a lot of what Morgan first put on deposit at the Metropolitan Museum, the idea was a lot of design material and still that functional utilitarian yeah. mindset mm -hmm. that's kind of aligned with the, the Victorian Albert London that these collections are for, for people to learn from and to use, yeah. like a real practical aspect to it. And I think yeah. that pragmatism is very American. We've, we've sort of stuck to the East Coast yes. at the moment. And there's a whole country yes. <laughs> going on. And people are <laughs> collecting in Chicago and St. Louis and San Francisco and wherever else. Um, but, but what's going on later? Once, once, the, once the Morgans and mm -hmm. the Gardeners and the Fricks have, have sort of planted their flag um, on the East Coast, what's going on across the country? I mean, you've got the Kreskys, you've got all sorts of, you know, sort of new mercantile fortunes mm -hmm. that are sort of establishing themselves. They're the like second generation, perhaps, of, of American collecting. Does that civic mindedness still carry through across the country? I think so. And, and, and I don't even know if the East Coast is necessarily the model for it, because a lot of, you know, there are a lot of major collectors who are collecting at precisely the same dates as, um, as Frick and Morgan mm -hmm. and Gardner. Mm -hmm. and, and they, uh, and I'll speak f from my new home, Chicago, <laughs> for a second, and, and you know, these, the, these generation of collectors begin collecting at precisely the moment that the Art Institute of Chicago is founded. So th they are intimately connected with the museum from the very beginning. And so if we think about civic mindedness in that way, I think there is a sense and a, and a sense of excitement on their part that there is a new institution beginning from scratch and they have the opportunity to help it become what it could be mm. in some way. Um, but I think if you're also going to draw a distinction between the East Coast and the rest of the country, a lot of, remember, a lot of the museums that are sprouting Chicago elsewhere, they didn't have collections to build from, so they formed committees with money, mm -hmm. and then they sent curators to Europe to buy, which I think is, is an interesting difference because a lot of the institutions here um, are a, reflect, a very personal reflection of a certain collector's definition of what should be seen. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in a lot of the Midwestern museums, and you have, and in Kansas City, it's, you have, you are empowering these curators to go into mm -hmm. Europe and to buy what they thought. You know, yeah. so it's right. just a slightly See, different. I, I would say that's not quite accurate in Chicago. Just not in because, Chicago, right. Maybe you know, I mean, the, the, the very identity of the Art Institute of Chicago is as the greatest repository of Impressionist painting outside of the Museum right. of Orsay. And that is very much the reflection of the collecting tastes in Chicago at that women. point in time. And a lot of whom were women. I mean, the most important of them, yeah. Bertha Potter yeah. Palmer, yeah. Um, who, and it, it's kind of topical right now, I guess, with one of the Monet yeah. brain sacks exactly. coming up, right. 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 which, in fact, if you look at the provenance, Bertha Potter Palmer was yeah. once the owner of that painting. She once owned nine Monet grain stacks at one time. And I, I mean, it's just, it's astonishing. And talk about being ravenous for a certain yeah. kind of painting. Just a very different kind of painting yeah. to what many of the great collectors of the exact same period in New York were collecting. And I, I've often sort of thought about, is it something to do with Chicago me, maybe being a more... A more of a young city at that point in time, a little more industrial in a way, or you know, <laughs> or the sort of agrarian. I mean, because I mean, they are essentially Western. collecting I think contemporary art. at the art. forefront of something that was a bit yeah. risky, yeah, of yeah I agree. daring and risk is right, also part of. And comparatively, you have yeah. Dr. Barnes bringing home yeah. similar mm -hmm. material to Philadelphia and being essentially shunned. Yeah. Well, that seems like the most pleasant cocktail. Well, far too many people have said for about <laughs> risk being <laughs> risk being part of the American eye. Yes, I um, think I think yeah. risk is is definitely yeah. a factor in it, and I think dealers saw it as a factor. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you're in America. You, these institutions are developing. Um, you know, there is a, a greater opportunity to take that chance and, and seize these opportunities mm -hmm. because 
you know, when you're trying to build something rather than build on something, mm -hmm. right? You know, you do have to, to take risks. So I do think, and, and you know, I think also when you look at the museums in Texas, like over the past 25 years, I think the amount of change and growth and mm -hmm. development and yeah. the addition of great Islamic collections and Mesoamerican mm -hmm. mm -hmm. collections um, and the initiative that's gone into that, um, there is a lot of, I mean, there's bold moves, there's risk, there's, and that really has sort of the spirit of, of Texans building up the museums in Texas has a lot of the spirit that I think is was very true around mm -hmm. 1900, the sense of allegiance, the sense of pride, and the sense of, you know, willing to, okay, let's let's do it, let's, <coughs> let's be yeah. bold, you know? Yeah, it's and a grand vision, I yeah. think. Well, I mean, there's yeah. this idealism that's yes, built into absolutely. America and, and as a can, whole. And yeah, this belief And it's, it's reflected so much in museums and collecting. Um, I find it really interesting that when you brought up Bertha Palmer, yeah. um, there there is not, to my knowledge, a corollary to Bertha Palmer in Europe. I mean, when you're thinking mm -hmm. women collectors, America has women collectors. Mm -hmm. And even though the, the, the press at the time was surprised, even shocked, even thinking, you know, what is this all about? Mm -hmm. You don't have the same, necessarily the same sort of idea of, of it being a controversial thing in Europe. I mean, you mm -hmm. have these, these women who, of course, are, are backed by, for better or worse, their husband's money, but their mm -hmm. husbands aren't buying Monet grain stacks. Yep. Bertha's buying Monet grain stacks. Well, and I mean, to speak on Abby Aldridge Rockefeller's behalf, if I can, I mean, she, you know, yeah. she was, her husband was collecting tapestries and, and ceramics and silver and, and antiquities. I mean, you know, when she, when she basically funded Charles Sheeler for the entirety of the w, WPA, he was not happy about that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, her, her foray into folk art collecting was to a certain extent because she had this limited allowance from him. Um, so there were, they were tied to the purse strings, but we do have this incredible um, narrative of, you know, you have Electra have a Meyer Webb in, right. in, up in, in Vermont, and you have, um, you know, MoMA is, is Lily yeah. Bliss and, and Abby Aldridge Rockefeller, and, and, um, and, and then I would say you have Alice Walton in, in Arkansas. I mean, there is this, inc th that is something I think that is very uniquely mm -hmm. American. Mm -hmm. And many of those women as well established quite strong relationships with artists. And I think yeah. that's a very interesting thing as well. I mm -hmm. mean, yeah. the, the, these women that were collecting living artists established really close relationships with a lot of them that uh, I, I, I don't see as much in, mm -hmm. in the history of male collectors. Yeah. Um, of that period as well, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, I was thinking of Alma Spreckles and Rodin, right, in exactly. San Francisco, for example. Yeah. I mean, the Berta would a visit Monet every year. Like so yeah, much exactly. of this in, in like in Chicago, the women's committees yes. were really important because yeah. it was social, but also you gained strength from having a group of people, you know, really yeah. pursuing these ambitions. It wasn't solitary. Yeah. Can we backtrack for just a moment? About because we're, we're we're focusing on paintings, we're focusing on on, on art as, as yeah. fine art, but furniture, <laughs> and ah. and uh, uh, which we're surrounded by yeah. terrific examples. You have of. to sit on it. You have to sit on it exactly. Um, and and early on, you 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 have sort of at the turn of the century this great sort of <clears throat> resurgence of interest in in 18th century French furniture, mm -hmm. which then sort of slightly dies and then mm -hmm. comes back after the war, which brings us to the Reitzmans. Um, although they, of course, were following in the footsteps of Thelma Chrysler Foy, who had already been there before them, but they bought better than she did. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of interested in this sort of uh, looking at um, 18th, particularly 18th century English and American furniture, which, which as we know today, is sort of really sleepy in the United States. That was the polite way. Yes. <laughs> it's napping. Um, napping, it's napping. Um, but, but I do find it really interesting because I think, again, you know, Americans, to go back to this, 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 this thought that all of our panelists have discussed, this idea of education, this idea yeah. of... Um, bring, so I think part of me has always felt that when Roman and Williams opens their redo of the British galleries at the Met, I think Brown furniture is going to be really perky again, <laughs> to a degree. Um, I'm really excited about it. I'm really interested in it, and I'd, I'd love to know, you know, what your thought is, because we're talking about in many ways the winter show, um, traditional furniture. 
and you know who's collecting it, why it's sleepy, is social is social media helping at all, or or, or I mean, are we so fixated on anything modern that we're never going to see an excitement about a cabriole leg again? Oh God. Matthew Shane Perry, the S curve, the S curve, gone, gone forever. Um, I don't know. I mean, I will say, you know, and again, this is just being a realist, and I and I am born of a of a family which collects brown furniture, three dimensional objects, um, made of wood, uh, and painted sometimes. Painted sometimes. Oh, painted well in the in the Pennsylvania <laughs> Journal <laughs> tradition, painted a lot. Um, and I'll never forget. The Seattle Art Museum once did this incredible, incredible installation, I think it was like 20 years ago, of a Donald Judd um, uh, bullnose, you know, step series with shaker chairs on, on fishing wire going up right next to it, like a stairway to heaven. And it was, there was the most amazing, I mean, there is such dialogue. Um, as we sit with Debbie Harry and, and uh, yeah, <laughs> um, as we sit with these same conversations. Um, look, I would love, I would love, love, love to think that it's coming back. And I think there are some very young and very exciting um, people in our midst who are, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I don't think it's my generation. I, I don't think, I think my generation is... Um, in the acquiring mode. It is very, very comfortable living with identifiable works of art on the wall and then serviceable furniture in the house, which is, um, for those of us who do appraisals all the time, covered in unbelievably overpriced fabric. Um, but that is, that is the, that is, that seems to be the template to a certain extent. There is some really exciting stuff happening. I see the generation below me. I see people. Um, I think a lot of it has to do, interesting and le interestingly enough, with the environmental movement. Um, I see a lot of people who are much more interested in reducing, reusing, looking to the past. How can we repurpose? Um, what are things that have a story? Um, and, and so I have much more hope in what's coming behind mm -hmm. me. I will probably spend the rest of my day selling more. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think, though, that, yeah. that you know, as new collectors are a bit intimidated by the you know, fine furniture in the sense that the yeah. knowledge of conservation, the manufacture of it, the, the quality of it, those have to be learned to some degree. You're finding yeah. your taste, but then you need to also to assess, you know, what am I going to bid on this? Right. Have a real sense or a good advisor right. to help you kind of... And I think there needs to be you said bid on this. Yeah. Because there was a moment where, as we all know, we were all living in the middle of it, um, where the private dealer with the street front shop yeah. yes. has, the aperture has narrowed to such an alarming degree yeah. Yeah. that now we are as private people yeah. bidding at auction against dealers who are wanting to add this to their stock in a way that it wasn't Well, you see what Charity First Dibs, like how that's changed yeah. the yeah. market hugely. Yeah. And I can oh, see oh, Charity First Dibs, oh, some of these yeah. websites, yeah. because yeah. you're going to be walking through yeah. downtown Hudson now. Um, <laughs> shops are closing. People are struggling. Yeah. There is a real tension there, because that's uprooted yeah. the market in a way and really changed that game, yeah. although it has then opened up the possibility of collecting fine furniture to so many more people right. Right. because of the accessibility, the accessibility of the platform. And yeah. so, uh, you know, it, it's, I'm sort of... But that can, our, of, you know, can our American desire for a narrative and knowledge and history, can we harness that in a way that will speak to a younger generation within a country where that's always been part of a collecting tradition? Mm. Um, I think you do, and we may end up compromising a bit on authenticity. Because I do think what's morphing is the speed, again, we talk about the voraciousness. I think that is very American. That is not going away. But it is the speed at which transactions happen. I mean, <laughs> how many people here go to buy something on Amazon and you get the like preferential pricing if you wait a week. <laughs> I don't think I've ever waited a week. <laughs> ever. I mean, I'm like, can I have it tomorrow? And I do have two small children, but I, I, I don't think I've ever waited a week. 
Um, <laughs> and, and I think that, so that maybe is where furniture and decorative arts, you know, it's interesting, and I will speak briefly about a couple who we, um, my company advised um, last year who were selling their collection, and it was contemporary works of art. Um, but what's interesting is they interviewed this amazing couple in their 90s, and they, inter they were interviewed uh, for, for a video, and, and they talked about first, their first purchases. And they said they went out into the market and they met with Leo Castelli and Arnie Glimpshire, so all the top guys at, P at Pace and Castelli, elsewhere, and every single one of the dealers said, here's a book, learn something and come back. And I remember watching that and thinking, there is not a single dealer in the <laughs> world right now who would say, here's a book, <laughs> come back to me in a month. Because it just, the speed of the transaction just doesn't, that's not where the next generation is. So I do think that you may end up with some compromise on, you know, getting underneath, and I grew up watching people get underneath furniture with big, big floodlights. Mm -hmm. um, and that may, or, or there are just super trusted advisors who do that and, and, and there's a premium for working with those people because you know you're getting the right thing. But I do think that somehow furniture and decorative arts needs to find a, a speedier acquisition model. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would help. Would anyone like to ask our oh, panelists uh, questions? Look, hands up. Wow. We're in a split second. <laughs> yes. Well, I have a statement and yeah. a question. Uh -huh. um, first off, um, one has to acknowledge, well, first of all, uh, one has to acknowledge the collecting gene. For example, <laughs> Frick came out of the coke and steel world of. Pittsburgh, and what made him want to do that? That's a statement. Um, the second thing is, um, there is such a thing as an eye, yeah. um, which Frick had. I mean, as you know, having worked there, I worked there in my very tiny uh, beginning of my career. Um, Frick initially collected contemporary Barbizon things. Exactly. Well, Lugaro, Cheryl, uh, I mean, it was... But they all did. Oh, are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every yeah. New York but, it was such a, that, was, that was the American taste. That was the taste. gateway drug. That was, that was, that was the world of the moment. Maybe it was just the costume. <laughs> but Frick, even though he was advised by Dubin and uh, Berenson and to some extent by Wildenstein, he had an eye. He, and that is one of the things Wait, that collected... Did he have the eye or did he develop the eye? Well, the eye... You know, I, I mean, we're talking about but, uh, No, I think there is a innate, an innate eye yeah. where somebody can see a great picture. I mean, there was Huntington in right. uh, California. He got one really great picture, the blue boy. But a colleague of mine once said, even a blind squirrel gets a nut every once in a while. collectors that I, contemporary collectors that I admire the most right now is John Landau, who yeah. has assembled one of the yeah. most astonishing collections of old yeah. master painting yeah. and sculpture. Yeah. And, you know, he really came into it with nothing. And I, I would say today that he has one of the great eyes in, 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 in the business. Yeah, but he talks about it as something that had to be opened up mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, by others, by experience. Yeah, is it exactly. intuition? Is it from exactly. study? And you yeah. have a bench of yeah. Altman's who yeah. go home and study and yeah. slowly make their well, purchases and, and build that and, up. And you have the Reitzmans, yes. yeah. 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 Who's, who, who hire the best advisors in the world right. um, and who travel with them all around the world, right. but who also study, 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 study. Yeah. yeah. And then I would say, I was at Sotheby's for the Bunny Mellon sale. Um, and I would say she had, it's funny, we talked about this, yeah. you know, what's the difference between taste and style? Um, and she had a very specific taste. Um, mm -hmm. There are collections that you see that truly couldn't have been assembled by anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that I think is innate. I don't know that you learn that. I don't know. No, leave that I open. Get close to you me. may. You still have a shot. I'm not. I'm not. And that's part of having an eye. Not well. yeah, yeah. 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 Well, some people decide so to be personal in their collecting, and some people decide yeah. 
uh, you know, to <coughs> be less personal if they have an institution in mind or they're trying to build yeah. something that's not personal. So yeah, see, not I, I wouldn't have necessarily said that Frick was a personal collector. Yeah, I don't think in, I mean, he took advantage. He had some um, great opportunities come his way. And, yeah, and, and but... Uh, the big check. Uh, yes, and he wrote the that. As Noah said, find your million. <laughs> <laughs> and there was always the idea that the monument would be left behind yeah. and that the monument would be what was remembered of him afterwards. So in a way, he was crafting a memory for himself and, yeah. and crafting the way that he would be remembered for generations to come. Yeah. Um, I think that was very self-conscious with him. Um, but it is the I, yeah. uh, ultimately, yes. and uh, you know, mm. quite the book. Yes. More, I just had a question, because I used to work for the Henry Flagler Museum in Palm oh, Beach, yeah. and he was a man who had absolutely no eye at all. Presumably he had two. Some Americans A fascinating just, man in many so. ways. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but certainly had the capability of collecting on the scale of someone like Morgan or Frick, and complete at every turn, yeah. bought the wrong thing, right. you know, bought by the yard. <laughs> Piles of it in the attic. I mean, it, it's just wrong, wrong, wrong. And I was just wondering whether you had exam other examples that you thought, because it is possible to fail as a major collector and historic, <laughs> perhaps not today, we would want to mention names, but sort of historical right. examples that you can think of that. Oh my gosh, during Morgan's lifetime, there were so many. But Morgan himself, if I didn't point to the gotcha. stuff that he collected that went into the Met, but if yeah. I showed you what he hung in his home, his brownstone at 219 Madison, <laughs> and the things he lived with, you would be horrified. <laughs> there was actually a painting by an artist who worked at Sev called Washing Cupids, and there's a woman, oh, Emma, that even sounds awful. who is literally <laughs> washing little cupids and hanging them out to dry on a clothesline. They actually hung in his reception room, where oh, everyone who visited him at home would have seen. Yeah. Um, and so this idea right. that he was Maybe a it was a red herring. I, it wasn't, because there, are, there were was there a of vault nuns. Behind they were, I mean, I could just go down this. I gave a lecture on what bad pictures he collected for his home. That's amazing. And you would be shocked. But you know what? Vanderbilt had the same. But it's and, that is you know, everyone across that. the sweep was yeah. living with. I mean, he had yeah. some truly, what we would consider atrocious bad paintings of historical <laughs> subjects. If, you know, I mean, Sir Francis Drake and any. He had one painted by a Scottish painter who was known as, um, his nickname was. Uh, Frozen mutton was the name. Oh. <laughs> and the painting hung over the fireplace in the dining room where if you went to dinner at Morgan's house, you would have sat. And it was a picture of a little oh. boy and girl lost in the woods oh. called Hansel and Gretel. Oh, and it's shocking. But yes, that is what he lived with. Yeah. in his home. Well, and it goes to show that the, the, the idea we have of these collectors now is filtered so through yes. you can the walk kind of culling of the collection. Like the and go, oh, my God, he's the most brilliant medieval collector. It changed the, the, you know, our idea of the Middle Ages. And, yeah. But if you saw the paintings he lived with, because those didn't go to a museum and because you don't know those, you, you, it's not that different from what Flagler was buying, and it's not that different from what I could name, you know, a dozen other collectors in the 1880s, 90s, all oh, Barbizon and yeah. and other anecdotal paintings, Mukaji's, you know, and he's at the, the high end of the range. I want <laughs> people who are just, you know, in some of these, the Samon who did the Washing Cupids, he was a painter who was supported by a Geneva banker. So is that the connection? There's so much more socially that determined mm, what yes. ended up where yeah, yeah, yeah. that we do not yeah. think of. And yeah. it's friendships, it's relationships. Charity it's right. auctions. But this was, you know, the great painting of Vanderbilt who lived two blocks away of his dining room. You can see it's hung with anecdotal paintings. And I think there is so much a taste of the time. And in Flagler's case, we can be very judgmental about it because it stayed together and we can see what it is. But Morgan's, that part was his private collection that then dissipated, was sold off later after his death by his son. And so I am still having a hard time tracing all of them now. Some of them pop up back up on the market for like $1,800. <laughs> The market at, at will, it's will unbelievable. regulate itself <laughs> It costs less than when Morgan bought it. There's no <laughs> I walked through, an est I, I worked on an estate years and years ago. It was in my former life, so I feel like I can talk about it. And it had an exquisite collection of American paintings. And it had, in fact, the maquette, the smaller version of 
Frederick Church's Icebergs, mm. which, oh, wow. when it sold in New York, was the first painting in New York to mil beat the million dollar mark um, in the 70s. Um, and so this was this exquisite painting, and I'll never forget, we walked into the owner's, the deceased owner's study, and my older, I was younger at the time, my older colleagues, American art experts from top to bottom, stood there absolutely stumped because there were two very luminous paintings on two walls next to the desk, so his desk, you know, the gentleman's desk, and they, I, we have no idea what those are, <laughs> said, oh, those are Thomas Kincaid's. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. And I was kind of embarrassed to know <laughs> what they were. I wasn't sure exactly if I should say that I knew what they were. <laughs> But I think that's more true than not. Yes. That's like, you know what I mean? So it is, it is very funny true. because we do yes. tend to romanticize and we can think of Morgan in a certain way. Oh, the Raphael altar yeah. the Met, but that wasn't what he was living The with. missteps yeah. are there was no Raphael so much more interesting than the masterpieces. Yes. What yes. were you thinking? I, I, yes. I, I wanted just to bring up, I remember going into um, a client's home, and I'm sure a, a number of people here know who I'm talking about. But I, I've always been fascinated by the why people collect and what inspires them and what they're attracted to. And this collector was the classic omnivorous, you know, with the means to collect whatever he wanted. And in his entry hall or in his first room as you entered the house, it was all Monet water lilies and a Picasso and and that was where he would receive people he didn't care about. And then if you, you know, were allowed to, you know, proceed further into the depths of, of, of you know, Stand his up. inner world, then you would see what he really cared about. And he Thomas had, yes. yeah. <laughs> no, but he had, you know, his Little of the War of 1812, and then his cowboy art, and his oh. antiquities, um. and all of his, and those were the things that really, really meant something to him. Yeah. But I just found it fascinating that he put on a show yeah. in his salon where he would receive people because he knew that the people who didn't know him, who knew nothing about art, would walk in and say, oh, he must be an art collector. Yeah. And uh, he was a brilliant, brilliant man and a true collector deep down, but those were his shows. Like, yeah. he didn't care about those things, but he understood that those were recognizable. But it, I just I, I just always think of him as a great example of somebody who had the foresight to understand the rest of the world and what how little they understand <laughs> and sort of the branding. And he, you know, he was coming of age in his collecting years at a time when, you know, the Japanese were all buying the impression is just like today they're all mm -hmm. buying you know you have to have your Jeff Koons in the entry hall yeah. so that you know you're taken seriously so it was the same type of thing from the 80s and 90s but it just <coughs> a fascinating fascinating story of it, it, what you're, you're talking about really I was in um, an, uh, an art dealers uh, uh, gallery in in Paris named should not be mentioned, he's genius, but name would not be mentioned. And it was the same week that some astonishing piece of modern art sold in New York for a jaw-dropping amount of money. And I remember walking into his office, and we were just going to talk about old master things. And on the sort of the narrow shelves all around his office, he had all of these different um, old master drawings, red chalk drawings, la 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 la. And I asked him, what is, what is all of this about? And he said, do you remember what just sold in New York for X amount of dollars? And I said, yes. And he said, you could buy yep. all this yep. for less than that. Yeah. Yeah. And it was all the names that we've ever heard yeah. in art history that we yeah. just fall to our knees. Yeah. Like, oh my God, I can own that. And, then yeah. I, and it was amazing to yes. me. I thought, or you could buy a cause for $14 million. You guys don't even know that. It's a <laughs> graffiti, graffiti artist. Um, <coughs> Who, who does paintings of, no, they're not even paintings, they're figures with the X's across the eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and and mm -hmm. the highest mark, the highest value at auction, I think had been a million dollars. And then there were a bunch of Asian buyers who went after one in Hong Kong and it sold for 14. Mm -hmm. it's a, it was a painting, a riff yeah. on The Simpsons, which was then a riff on the Beatles cover album. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, it's an exquisite work of art. I encourage you all to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to look back on this era, you know, the way we look back on, on, on the tulip wars, 
and we're completely astounded. Like, how could that have possibly happened? How could people fall for that? Like, what? That makes no sense. And and there will, you know, I keep saying, I, I, you know, I'm just, I hope I'm young enough still that that I will see the backside of this because mm -hmm. there are so many, there are so many um, influences creating this crazy, crazy moment. And you think, okay, I hope that, um, I just keep thinking about that scene in, in The Money Pit where Tom, <laughs> Tom Hanks is stepping on a carpet and his house yeah. is falling apart and he falls through a hole and the whole rug just goes <laughs> boom. And I keep thinking, okay, we're all on the same carpet. We have nothing to do with it, you know, but I feel like at some point we're all gonna go you know, when the when the when Tom Hanks falls through the hole. And I just, you know, I fear for that day because I hope that the rest of what we all do and live for doesn't get thrown into the soup of, you know, X's on a Simpson eyepiece for fourteen million and But you on know, the upside, I mean yeah. Now's the time to buy Old Masters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, you know, do you know who one of the biggest buyers of Old Masters is? <laughs> Jeff Koons. Jeff Koons. Yeah. 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 Jeff Koons. George Kondo buys 18th century French masterpiece yeah. furniture. Honestly, they're all laughing their way to the bank. Exactly. You know? And they're buying from us. They are, they're are our clients. You know, I say are not my like foundation, but the gallery, I mean, that is, that if that doesn't tell you everything, are they, is Jeff Koons buying, you know, uh, cause? No, he's buying an old master. So it's, um. Well, we have a broader conception now of, you know, people aren't trying to cre create period rooms anymore. Yeah. I mean, you right. don't collect one kind of thing yeah. Yeah. and have matching furniture yeah. and matching, you know, walls. <laughs> right. you, you do what you're seeing in here. Yeah, yeah exactly. You, you're not. The new generation doesn't want to do the Reisman thing, no. I don't think. Uh, you know, the most intelligent collections that I see now mix yeah. old masters and contemporary yeah. and modern works in yeah. ways which tell you everything you need to know about their personality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The act of buying things and placing them in the room is, you know, an utterly creative act for these people. Yeah. We were talking the other day, um, for me, Tom Hill is the great mm -hmm. example yes. of this. Yeah. Um, here, here is a man who has an astonishing collection of, of modern art and yet also has one of, I would say, the top three private collections of Renaissance bronzes. Bronze, and yeah. they're all exhibited together. I mean, yeah. you know, you, you've got a Cy Twombly yeah. chalk painting yeah. over the mantelpiece and then lined up underneath a Renaissance bronzes. Yeah. And they just work together. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I think it now is a great moment yeah. to be creative about collecting and to look for ways in which artists at on some level at some point have always addressed similar issues. Yeah. And and that you you can speak to each other across the centuries. Well when you look back <clears throat> also in the nineteen sixties and the early seventies and you look at people who are buying in you know the, the, the latest modern art, but then you're also they're also pairing it or seeing it on top of a, an 1810 empire table right. or a, 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 this this idea that that mixing is 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 new as, as we all know it's not, it's new. not new. but on the on, yeah. on the other hand it is constantly regenerative mm -hmm. it's this constantly exciting moment of putting a disparate two things together right. and seeing how they speak together well, and, and more is it adjusts both to then what's available in the market yes, and also to exactly. what you're seeing at other you know people's right. homes yeah. in a way. So you know it's the same thing that in Morgenstern was reinforcing these bad paintings in everyone's homes, or soon after that, like the influence of Boda and mixing up sculpture and painting right. and making period yeah. rooms. Now that's more the zeitgeist is that you mix these things up and it works both visually, I think, yeah, yeah. but it also works because to collect in these pockets in the market mm -hmm. and to get the best of what's available in these certain yeah. fields that can still be put together. Yeah. And so it sets this new yeah. template that now, yeah. as a collector, people are responding to. Yeah, you may not be able to go deep anymore yeah. in, a, in a single area or field. Yeah, yeah. it's very true. But, it, you but you can go both. Yes. yes. Which is lovely. Yeah. Which yes. brings us back to Morgan. Exactly. And all those people <laughs> you can go broad. Right. And if you also, that also speaks to the time, like, 
I, I find it very interesting that the end of the 19th century and then right now we have a similarity in this sort of global thinking in our collecting and that you know we don't do business in one tiny little region. If you're gonna succeed in business, you have to be able to you know, function in the Asian markets and European markets and, and the Middle East. So mm -hmm. why, it, it's not at all surprising to me that we would wanna be eclectic and show, and also that collections are supposed to, in many ways, reflect how intelligent we are. So, mm -hmm. you know, how broad we, we are as thinkers. So, you know, in the Victorian era, and you would have your Japanese with your Renaissance and your, you know, you mixed it all up mm -hmm. and it showed how sophisticated you were as, you know, and as the industrialists were doing business overseas. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was reflective of their reach. So um, it, it seems much more of an uh, American way of doing business, is of collecting to, to collect on a global scale that way. Well, see, I'm wondering though, is, is, is the, does the global scale of collecting as it is now undercut an American eye? Is there an American eye anymore well, based on our global but appreciation? I, but I would say, I mean, again, having spent the last, so again, you know, if you look, and, and I'm sorry, I am like the modern contemporary girl um, and then the market person, but Correct. if you look at the last 10 years, you know, there is this, this is where the explosion of value has come into them. I mean, we, you know, went from sort of a $30 billion a year industry to a $60 billion a year industry in a very short period of time. Um, and a lot of that has been masterpiece collecting. So like in 2018, you know, the number of things that sold in, the, and I'm not just talking about at auction, but across the board, that were valued at a million dollars and up went up by 16%, but the overall number of lots went down, or items sold, transactions, went down by 5%. So you have more expensive things, but fewer of them. Um, and there's been a lot of sameness in that decade. There's, it's felt like there's an amazing documentary out there by Nathaniel Kahn, who's the son of Louis Kahn, who did also My, my Father, My Father, My Architect. Um, and this is his now, his look into the contemporary art world. And he interviews this woman in, a, in an apartment in Park Avenue who said that she's been in the same apartment on that line on every floor of her building and she's seen a Warhol and a Richard Prince hanging on the same wall in every single line. So there has been this remarkable sameness, but then I would say in the last two seasons, um, at least again in the marketplace, you suddenly had extraordinary numbers for female artists, for African American artists, for, you know, the, the and that is happening on the American platform, not, I mean, you have a little bit with Jenny Savile in London, but um, the push is American, I think, to, to redefine, to, to head into new frontiers, and to maybe get away a little bit from this checkbox. Um, so that maybe is, is hope and a continuation. A question. Mm. Well, this is one of the, the so, box. yeah. <laughs> no, one of the things that I think is so interesting, having worked in so many different arenas within the art world, is the effect of media mm -hmm. and the effect of social media mm -hmm. on both tastes, uh, the market, and um, and frankly, what actually gets coverage. I mean, mm -hmm. I hate to say this, you're kind of a rarity, uh, in terms of people that are yes. really pressed, that are really, really looking at objects. I, I did a panel discussion a few years ago and I had an art critic, an art editor, uh, from a major art publication, an editor in chief, and a market editor. And I challenge them all to the future of like, what is the art market? And, 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 and what are you covering? And the critic <coughs> there had covered the same exhibition at a museum three separate times, but yet I know several exhibitions that friends of mine were putting on in galleries he hadn't even set foot into. Wow. And I, and I did put it to him, what is, is this advertising? <coughs> is this the clicks? Mm -hmm. Is this the, what, what, is, what is forming our new reality? So I would love to put that to, to all of you, both in the, from the market standpoint and from the museum standpoint, as you're also dealing with your board and your patrons and you as a writer, I'd mm -hmm. love to get your feedback. So who are the influencers? Who are the influencers and, 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 and how, do we, how do we, presumably everyone that's in this room, has an affinity for work that is three dimensional. 
three-dimensional and or also older it has a history mm -hmm. yeah. how do we for lack of a better term make it sexy again to the generation that you say is coming up behind you which i do we're see right. we're done um, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not my people. No, I yes, It's not, yes, it's yes, not yes. my generation either, except for a few. But, yeah. but the generation behind. But how do we how do we work together to to reframe the narrative? I mean, I know with my Instagram, which does not have a gargantuan number of followers, but I'm very proud of the twenty four thousand that I do have. Um, I, 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 trust me, it's dwarfed compared to a number of other people. But I am really surprised, and I'd love to know um, the aggregate age. But I know when I put up something that I refer, which a friend of mine in England refers to as pretty things, how it's like over like a thousand likes. But if I put on something modern, it can sit there for like twenty. And I'm always like, oh, wow. where, yeah. what's so going strange. on? Because I keep wanting to reach out to whoever's liked yeah. it, saying, what exactly did what you, you like about liking? this? Yeah. Hmm. And I, I do think there is, and to sort of pull it into a sort of more general concept, I think there, there is this sort of hunger for, for very pretty, very comfortable, idiosyncratic rooms that have some sort of historical anchor. I mean, the, the, the color will draw you in, mm -hmm. but there, there, there is, as long as there's a high-low and there's, there's there are masterpieces and, and not so much masterpieces, but the idea is this idiosyncrasy mm -hmm. people seem to be drawn to, at least when I look at the weird things that I post. They're kind of the way Morgan collected. Yeah. Well, and, and we do well. It's interesting with our posts, you know, we do very well with a lot of the historic interior posts, mm. and you know, I think we've amped up our game in telling stories about mm. the old it's master like material. Story. Right. Yeah. It's really the, the stories. stories. It's about stories. catching people in part with the image, but a juicy tale. And yeah. you know, we could put up a letter from, you know, the, the 15th century, and you can't really, you know, it's Instagram. You can't really see the letter too clearly, but then you'll see the story on it, and people will click through. Yeah. And so I find that the quality of the stories we tell and yeah. how catchy and how gripping they are, you know, that yeah. is a big part of it. And we also seem to get, I think, people who are self-selecting against maybe the flashier things and are mm -hmm. looking for something with a little bit more depth because I think we're perceived as, you know, a serious institution mm -hmm. with the nature of our collections. We also need to find a way, I think, to do more often now ways of bridging what otherwise might seem to be completely different kinds of objects to give people a way in. So um, uh, I worked on a show last year at the Met Breuer, which was called Like Life, and it, and it dealt with you know, the history of a certain kind of idea about representation. But the idea was to juxtapose, juxtapose contemporary works with much older works from centuries before. And the idea is you're sort of, in a way, doubling your audience and, and making your audience cross over. Right. Mm -hmm. In a way, you are, you know, so you, you have younger people that perhaps only know about contemporary art or only care about contemporary art coming into a museum, being introduced to older works of art through contemporary works yeah. of art, um, or in many cases, which I saw, not being able to distinguish between yeah. what was new and what was old. And, you know, and, and, and so I think we need to create more opportunities yeah. for people to experience things they don't know that much about through the things that they do know about yeah. already. Um, There's the answer. There's the answer. Awesome. Jeff Koons and his old master. Right. <laughs> it's American. Well, and Ellie, I mean, I love Ellie well, Shushen. Uh, as one of our oh, dealers. Oh yeah, Ellie Shushen does a great and, job. And she has her Instagram, which is the portrait portrait miniatures of like dead old white people. I mean, you know, everybody's. Yes. But she tells these, <laughs> but they're saucy stories. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's here. But she lady also so exhibits so. during the show. Yeah. Those miniatures of African American which like portraits. Yes. And, yeah. And uh, but they're the, we're, they're within the same. Not yeah. necessarily the same medium, but they're yeah. within the same idea, Spirit. and that yeah. absolutely transports me yeah. beyond. Yeah. You know, yeah. suddenly I appreciate those silhouettes right. in a way that I didn't appreciate them yeah. in a the way. But to, to see them juxtaposed, yeah. you realize that it's still a fresh idea, yeah. and it becomes a really edgy idea when it's it, it's approached by an artist who gets the size, gets what it was all about, yeah. but then populates it with 
um, uh, African American people who yeah. are in the same way in the same way that Kanda Wiley yeah. busts thrill me that yeah. there's like a renaissance moment but mm -hmm. it's yeah. A 20th century, 21st century African face. Right. That amazes me. Because it's a celebration of craft. Yeah. Which I do think, again, you can draw, a, and then I really think we have these people going. Yes, we do. Yeah, but, I just, I'd like yeah. to add something. Oh, sorry. Excuse sorry. Me. In relation to what you were just saying about uh, uh, con confronting uh, antique art and contemporary and making one understand the other through the other, etc., it seems that there is a trend lately, in the past few years, not long where uh, curators uh, are enjoying, and I think some of them are fine, others I think are a little light, um, because it seems like a trendy idea, yeah. where they're confronting uh, an yeah. ancient uh, art form or artist with contemporary. For instance, I saw in London not too long ago Michelangelo and Viola. Yes. Well, that was yeah. quite a juxtaposition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> With reservations, really. <laughs> okay, and we had also um, uh, in Amsterdam, uh, what's on right now, Hockney and, and mm -hmm. Van Gogh. Yeah. That was very interesting, and yeah. probably the most interesting Hockney exhibition I've ever seen. <laughs> really? um, so it seems that it's the trend yeah. already in the museum world. Yes. And but the auction happening. world as well. And it's it happening yeah. in the galleries. Auction like houses are doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Nicholas Hall. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody yeah. is trying to get into the contemporary scene uh, by reviving their business, you know, uh, the antiques or antiquities right. or whatever. Right. But I think from the museum point of view, this is a little new and yeah. it's interesting. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's pushing it a little too far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be rather critical about it. Yeah. You have Absolutely. to be careful. Absolutely. No, I agree. I mean, it's, it, it's good for museums to be experimenting like this, but I would never suggest that a museum only does shows that, you know, right. we, we have a duty to present our audiences with different models for putting together exhibitions mm -hmm. and for putting artworks together, whether that be a, his, a historical exhibition that deals with one moment in time or a monographic exhibition or one of these exhibitions that places artworks in from context. disparate yeah. times and places into some kind of dialogue. I think they're all viable models, but we should never feel that one trumps the other or that we should only do one. Yeah. But it is um, a risk. I mean, you, yeah. you often are, you know, you're, and you're trying a new template and, and sometimes it's Absolutely. Putting, and, but we've yeah. all seen ones that really work and you're like, I mean, they, you, yeah. can, you can very quickly see sometimes, you know, just like a cheap shot to get people to come in the door. But no, 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 nobody the way, wants to feel yeah, the, the way yeah. the right. way that Emerson, you did it. I, you know, I, I, I talk so much about your exhibition just because I thought it was so mm -hmm. powerful and so beautifully, beautifully done. But it was taking a subject matter and saying how have gender, you know, yeah. and you didn't, you didn't present it chronologically. You just sort of said these are different viewpoints on the same subject and death and the body and nudity and whatever and you were talking about the human form and you had a conversation between different periods but you allowed the pieces to speak to each other and, and nothing argued it was it was, you know, as you, you said, simple, it, you need a simple, it was simple very, idea. very simple idea, and yeah. it was so. Is there anything I learned? Is that you cannot have a complex argument to begin with. You choose, and what could be more relatable and more simple, or well, also more complex, I guess, than the body? Than you know, body. I mean, it's something. And you just said you reminded everybody. You know, as I'm always saying, like everything was contemporary at one point. You know, everything was contemporary once. And, and there's a great expression that, you know, history has a great way of getting rid of what it no longer needs. You know, those things that last, that transcend, that remain in our, in our, in our mindset, you know, you know, what remains important. And even looking at contemporary and saying, okay, what's going to last? You know, and I love looking at contemporary as an old master person because I love sort of saying, well, that's not going to last. Like, you know, <laughs> Absolutely beautifully made, and I have great respect because I'm spending my entire life looking at art, and I can respect what that artist did. So you know, it's it's we're having the same conversation. We're just looking at different periods. That's all. So and people forget that because they get so fixated. At, oh, I'm a contemporary collector. I bought that at Freeze. You know, 
but you know, get over it and just remember we're looking at art. Mm -hmm. So. And you know the good news yeah. is that I think the younger generation that Courtney is pointing to, the younger the, no, well, the generation that was raised in art fairs as opposed to galleries, mm -hmm. and the generation that was weaned on Instagram, mm -hmm. where you can see everything at once, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they view things in this way naturally. Yeah, it's not a learned idea. perspective, it's the entry point. Yeah. It's, it's voracious, yeah. it's omnivorous, and it's where they're beginning. So I love that. Whereas my mother once money. left me in the period <laughs> rooms at the Met, so she could go down and see something in a gallery downtown. I obviously survived. You know what? Okay, Very I different would, lens. There is, there is um, I'm talking too much as if I'm like up there with you guys, but. There is a, a great young woman I've recently come to know, and um, I've been putting her on stage a few times because I think she's brilliant. And she was raised in museums and in galleries, and uh, she's a child of uh, great, great collectors. And she told me a story that she would, every Sunday, go to the Met with her father, or go to a gallery, or go, she would go into a gallery, meaning in a museum or in a gallery. And her father would ask her three questions. What's the most important thing in the room? What's, what do you love the most in the room? And what's the most valuable in the room? Mm -hmm. And it, 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 she, so she learned sort of the market, the historical importance, and what she liked all at the same time on a regular basis. And I thought, oh my god damn, why are my kids 18 years old? I wish I had done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which one would you break first? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so two-year-olds, that's what yeah. they do. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank, Thank you. you.